everybody. Uh, my name is Roshan Sethna, and this is my colleague Barry Roeder. Um, we are here to talk to you today about our latest wave of digital innovation in government. Um, and we're here to talk to you about how it's kind of doing two things. Um, one, it is reinventing service delivery between agencies and citizens. And two, it is really starting to help transform government as a system. Um, and that's really exciting to us. Uh, Barry and I have had the privilege of working on digital product here in San Francisco uh, with the Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development where Barry works. Um, and we have seen how it's improved service delivery and we've also seen um, how it's starting to transform government, especially at the policy level. Um, so I'm going to um, first introduce myself and give Barry a chance to introduce himself. Um, like I mentioned, my name is Roshan. Um, I'm a partner at Exigy. Um, Exigy is a digital innovation studio based here in San Francisco in the Mission. Um, we are focused on building healthy and resilient communities, and I lead our civic tech practice. So Exigy has a really deep civic tech practice since even before I was at the firm. Um, we've worked with several local um, agencies and regional agencies, um, including the Mayor's Office of Housing, um, but also local transit organizations like BART and MTC, um, educational um, organizations such as the school district, um, and the Committee of Information Technology, and a variety of agencies in the city and county of San Francisco. Um, so personally, I was really excited to start working on um, this housing project a few years ago yeah. because my background in education um, is policy. But right out of school, um, I was a housing counselor in Houston. Um, and this was right after the financial crisis. So um, there were a lot of rules that were changing with regards to housing, especially home ownership. And one of my um, jobs was to kind of help first time home buyers in particular navigate these new rules. Um, and it was pretty tough for people to kind of stay up to date on um, what was available to them, what they were eligible for. Um, and so my role as a counselor was really important, but also involved a lot of manual research and looking things up and double checking things. Um, so I was really excited to work on a product um, in San Francisco that could help people access those resources on their own and navigate them in a really easy way. Um, and Barry's gonna talk a little bit more about the product that we built and introduce himself. Good morning, everybody. My name is Barry Roeder, and it's true I work at the Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development in San Francisco. We are the agency that's responsible for building and overseeing all of the affordable housing in San Francisco. We have multiple portfolios of housing. My role there is strategic initiatives, and I'm focused particularly on digital strategy for the department. And I've worked with Roshan, as she indicated, on um, one of the projects that we'll, we'll talk about today, um, which of course is our Dahlia Housing Portal. Sorry about this. Get that fixed. Great. So the Dahlia Housing Portal, it's the San Francisco Affordable Housing Portal. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it. It's at housing.sfgov.org. It is a product that we built to create a single stop resource for people that are looking for and wanting to apply for affordable housing that didn't exist before. Uh, we've been fortunate recently to win a couple of awards. Uh, one is the Spur Good Government Award and the other is the Digital Leader Award. So we're getting some traction and uh, we actually have some news. We're expanding the platform regionally. Um, Alameda County has sound on recently. It'll be the first regional platform of its kind, which is pretty exciting. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. So before we go further, though, I thought it would be useful to talk, bear with me, a little bit about the role of government. Um, some of you might know, depending on the circles that you travel in, it's pretty easy for technologists to be dismissive of legacy systems. It's clunky, it's old, it doesn't work, throw it out. Let's have a hackathon over the weekend and we'll just replace everything with an app. Um, well, you can imagine, you can think about services that you get from your jurisdiction wherever you live. There are certain things, streaming, the cleaning the streets or showing up to vote or certain things that couldn't be replaced by an app. And there are some really great things actually about legacy systems. Um, some of them in fact are still best practice. Uh, first of all, is it's a democratic system, obviously with an eye on equity. 
there's a focus on all the constituencies, not just who has the money for whatever app, but it's, it's the way we're set up. It's how we do business as a democratic society, and that's represented in our legacy systems. Um, so again, some, and, and also, um, some of these systems that when they were introduced were, again, initially best practice. The problem with them is that innovation comes slowly. Uh, things don't move that quickly in terms of how we improve or how we respond to current needs with the systems that we have. So we'll talk a little bit more about how we can make some adjustments to that. So just to dive a little bit deeper into the current system, because you know Barry and I kind of believe that you need to understand the context in which you're working and so that you can evolve the system itself. Um, so you guys are probably really familiar with this, but um, one of the biggest levers that government obviously has is policy. Um, and oftentimes, uh, policy is made at the top, so that might be housing policy, transit policy, healthcare policy. Um, it is then sort of pushed down uh, to the agency or department level, right? So there might be housing authority, a healthcare department, um, a transit authority that is carrying out a lot of the policy that is set by legislators or policy makers. Um, and the way they often do that is through programs and services that then you and I interact with as members of the public, right? Um, and so one thing we've started to see in the last 10, 15, 20 years is people have started to say, how can we better uh, serve citizens? How can agencies better uh, to actually deliver services to citizens through those programs and services that they're offering? Um, and in the digital age, we've started to see that that is often done with digital products. So this is kind of where digital products tend to sit, whether they're websites, mobile applications, um, informational applications, they sit at this level. They have really helped um, agencies better deliver services to the public. Um, one of the really big examples of this that you guys are all familiar with is the healthcare.gov redesign. Um, so we've seen digital innovation work really well at this level. Um, but we think that uh, these products actually have an opportunity to change more than just service delivery. And that's what we're gonna chat a bit about today. Um, so one product we wanted to uh, talk to you guys about is a product that Barry and I have worked on, which is called Dahlia. Um, so Dahlia, as Barry mentioned, is a one-stop shop for affordable housing listings in San Francisco, and it also offers a, a space for citizens to apply for that housing. Um, Dahlia stands for the Database of Affordable Housing Listings, Information, and Application. There will be a quiz at the end of this. Um, and it's also the city flower, which is cute. Um, so we were able to really centralize resources in one place, um, but it took the last two and a half years to sort of robustly build out this site. Um, when we started the project in 2015, um, and Barry's team had started it really earlier than that, um, but when Exigy came into it, we were trying to understand um, with the city, what was the landscape we were facing? What are, what's the actual problem that we're really trying to solve? Um, so the Mayor's Office of Housing contracted with Exigy as well as a couple of different agencies to help solve this issue. Um, so what we first did was we, we understood the landscape, right? So we, um, at the time, understood that the late Mayor Ed Lee had um, some goals around housing. Um, he was slated to build 30,000 new units by 2020, and 10,000 of those are slated to be permanently affordable. Um, so we all know the city has uh, a housing crisis and there um, were efforts being made to increase the actual housing stock. Um, however, as this housing stock is coming online, one of the problems was how do you find it? Um, how do you find all these units in various buildings um, and navigate them? And the answer to that at the time was not very easily. Um, so this is kind of facing uh, when they were searching for housing in 2015. Uh, there were several different government agency sites, right? So you might go to the healthcare department, the housing department. Um, also, oftentimes, um, nonprofits created their own resources, so you could go to those lists. Um, it was really tough for people to understand uh, what information is most up to date. Um, they were seeing inconsistencies between different sites, um, and they were also having to navigate really text-heavy sites um, to understand, am I really eligible for this? Is my household size too big or too small? Is my income level just right? 
Um, so they're trying to navigate a lot of resources. And we did have a lot of what we call kind of power users that were able to navigate this system and knew it really well. Um, so let's say you were one of those power users and you, you did navigate the system. Uh, you were able to find a housing listing or a resource that you were going to apply to. Um, what happened then? So at that point, you were met with this, generally. Um, so at the time, the application process was all on paper, so no digital application. Um, you had to usually go in person to pick up the application because each building had a different application. So you had to make sure to get the right application for the right building. Um, and once you did get your hands on it, these applications were really lengthy. So 15 plus pages often required a lot of um, kind of supplementary information, your tax returns, your pay stubs, things like that. Um, it was a really cumbersome process to get the application together. It might take several days to do that. Um, and so let's say you were able to do that also. So you took several days, you were able to get through the application process, compile all the information you need for that listing, um, and you were ready to turn it in. So at, what, at this point, um, you would go to the building, generally to turn it in, and you'd be met with this, um, which, um, you know, was not a really great experience for housing applicants um, because oftentimes all of the applicants would really need that full application window to put their um, application together. Um, so many times people were waiting until the last minute uh, to apply and up until kind of that 5 p.m. deadline on that application day. Um, so this is not only a bad experience for the housing applicant, but a really stressful experience for the leasing agents and the building owners who are trying to manage getting everyone's application in by that due date. Um, so really stressful process all around. Obviously, if you're um, you know, parents, if you have multiple jobs, if you don't have time to stand in line for several hours, um, and, and people were often uh, applying to several listings. So this would happen kind of every time you were, uh, needed to submit an application. Um, so let's say you were able to get through this step also, um, and you actually turned in your PayPal application to the leasing agent. Um, what was that post-application process like? Um, and actually, I might let Barry speak to this because he's uh, particularly passionate about the post-application process. R Rochelle knows when we talk about Dahlia that one of my favorite things is right here, the, the carnival drum. Uh, which I, I don't think Twitter or Google or most tech companies don't have one of these. Um, so yeah, you turned in your application and we literally pulled out a roll, you know, think about the toilet paper unfolding of the red carnival tickets and you got one and one went in the drum and we had to tape the door of this drum shut because it flies open when we spin it and we had to pull the tickets out. It's, it's an absurd process, um, at least for this day and age. And I want to give, give credit and thanks to the folks that came up with this whenever they did decades ago. I'm sure it was best practice at that time. It's not best practice now. Uh, quick note about uh, the fact that we do place our units through a lottery process in San Francisco. Um, that varies by jurisdiction in the Bay Area. There's a combination of waitlist and lottery. Both of those things are functional in Dahlia. Yeah, and you know, just to add for transparency purposes, um, let's say you know a thousand people applied to a listing, um, the mayor's office of housing staff would literally have to pull every single ticket out of that drum because if I'm an applicant, I want to know that I got pulled, even if I got pulled at number 900 or 950. <coughs> Um, so again, not only a stressful process for the applicant, but stressful for Mayor's Office of Housing staff who are really managing these lotteries for each of the buildings in San Francisco. Um, so, um, you know, once the um, applications were actually in and the lottery was run, um, oftentimes these lotteries were just posted, and this part actually was digital. They were posted online, and people could see their ranking um, in the lottery system. But there's not a really great way after that to know when you're going to get a listing. Um, so that's kind of the the different problems uh, we are facing, both um, in the housing landscape and the the problems that the citizens were facing that were applying. Um, our solution. Um, this is the dramatic pause. Um, our solution was um, was Dahlia. So you can access Dahlia at housing.sfgov.org. Um, I can talk 
for uh, length about the different features that we really have built out over this site because we've at this point been working on it for over two and a half years. Um, one of the ethos that we had when we built this site was to offer affordable housing seekers the same level of experience and dignity that market rate housing seekers would get when they're searching. So um, an experience that you may be really used to on a Trulia or a Zillow, um, we wanted to offer that same level of experience. Um, and one of the things we did throughout really the last two and a half years is um, every few weeks we user tested uh, with uh, users. So actual housing applicants, past, present, future, um, we put mock-ups or actual code in front of them, asked them to do a certain task, see um, how they got through that task on the site. Um, and one of our early user testers uh, was you know, looking at the screen in front of her and said, am I in the right site? I'm not sure, is this the right site? And we're like, yeah, yeah, that's the right site. This is Dahlia. Uh, we'd like you to you know, see if you can find a listing you're eligible for. Um, she was like, I don't think this is my, the site I'm supposed to go to. This looks too nice. Um, I don't think this is affordable housing. Um, and this is something we really were also trying to do with Dahlia is rebuild um, trust between government and citizens. Um, everyone in this room has stood in line at DMV at some point for six hours. Like We're not used to a certain level of experience when we interact with government. Um, and so that was part of engaging users in this process to say, yep, this is for you. These are resources um, that, that we want to serve you with. Um, so a couple of things that we did on this site. Um, one, we streamlined the actual housing listing. So that's the thing on the right. Um, we made it a really standardized format. So now all of the listings um, have really consistent data and information. Uh, we also you know, turned it into a really storytelling format from the text heavy sites um, to this. And we surfaced information people cared about the most. So people really told us during user testing, just tell me the minimum income I need to get into this unit and tell me what the rent is. Tell me those two pieces of information and then give me more information. If I want to dig in, I will. Um, so we really designed the information hierarchy of this page very intentionally based on what people were telling us they needed when they're browsing. Um, and uh, just made it really, you know, storytelling format. Um, so the second thing we did was we standardized and digitized the application process. So that's um, on the mobile screen on the left. Um, we turned it into a step-by-step, -step, really easy to read application process. We call it our short form application process because um, one of the things we did is that we talked with a lot of leasing agents um, and housing developers and said, hey, at this point, people are really just applying to be in a lottery to have a chance to get a unit. So what is the basic amount of information you need from people? Like, why are you asking them for their tax returns right now? Do you really like need that to run a lottery? Um, so we kind of worked with them to understand what the minimum fields were, um, and we were really able to reduce what we were asking of the user to make it comparable to what they were applying for. So if I'm just spending a few minutes applying, and my chances are maybe not so great because the lottery is big that time, um, at least I'm only spending a few minutes applying instead of spending several days, right? So again, treating the user with this level of dignity. Um, the site is also translated into the city's uh, main languages. It's accessible, so um, folks that need to use screen readers, for example, can read through it. Um, and it really set up kind of a foundation for as these listings are coming online, um, they can kind of get inserted into this really standardized format um, that we're using now. So a couple of statistics on um, how the site's been doing. It now takes 15 minutes to apply online. Um, it's shorter if you even use one of your past applications to pre-fill a new application. Um, and so that took that several day process, reduced it down to 15 minutes. Um, when that application, um, the online application feature went live, which was uh, November of 2016, uh, we saw that about
November of 2016, and about 130 listings have gone through the site. Um, however, something that we are super proud of and we are excited to see this stat grow um, is that about 100 um, households have been placed in units per month. Um, of course, as listings come online and as larger listings come online, we're, we're seeing this grow and we're really excited to be able to track how many folks we're placing over time. Um, and so we've had a lot of success with this product, again, on the service delivery side um, and the ability to measure how many people we're placing. Um, but it wasn't just kind of dropping design and code in people's laps. We weren't saying, here's a site, great, use it, um, moving on. Um, there was a lot of things that kind of happened in the background. Um, it's kind of like change management process at the city um, that have made this product successful. So one of the things we kind of wanted to um, share with you guys is some of the learnings from what has made Dahlia effective. So that at your agencies and organizations, if you're embarking on building a product, um, you can kind of learn from the stuff we learned. That's right. I think this is the point where I say, don't try this at home. I mean, uh, so the mayor's office of housing and community development tried this at home a couple times before this, and it wasn't successful. Um, so there's a lot that we've learned along the way uh, that we thought we wanted to share with you about key elements in creating a successful public sector uh, service delivery product. Um, the first of them is the idea, Roshan's talked about this, about asking the user. So there's a story that I love to tell. Jay was talking earlier about and of course this conference today is about building bridges between the different sectors. So we were fortunate through the Mayor's Office of Civic Innovation at the time to be the recipient of one of the first civic bridge projects that placed some very sharp Googlers with the Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development for four months to help us look at the problem and how would we approach this. And, and so one of the things that we asked them, I remember this, is sort of like, Wow, you know, and not, not, not only these Googlers, but these are like really smart Googlers. So what's the secret of like, you know, like how do you guys ask the user? I know, I know, but like what's like the Google secret? Like what's the, ask the user. Okay. Um, and it's, it's really important. And you know, the idea is to sit regularly with people that actually have to use this. It doesn't mean, well, let's have a community conversation on one afternoon in a conference room and think about what are you looking for? Or let's build something and then send out a survey monkey and say, do you like it? Yes, no, on a scale of one to 10. It's like, no, 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 let's sit with people all the way through and uh, you know talk about what their needs are. And it's not just the evidence. There's a whole ecosystem around this project. There are housing developers, leasing agents, property managers on one side, housing counselors and other housing advocates on another side, and they've all got valuable things to bring to this. Um, so having them at the table is really important. The next piece is something that probably a lot of you in the room are familiar with, but the idea of develop this in an agile fashion, capital A. So the idea of agile, the, the story I like to tell about that is that for those of you that went to college and are of a certain age, you probably turned in a binder for your semester project and it had the tabs in all the right spots and everything was perfectly typed and you didn't dare turn that thing in without everything perfect. The problem with that though is that you did that in your dorm room or whatever in a vacuum. You were creating that without input from the people that had to buy it, in this case your professor or whoever, to get Con, you know, some conversation about, well, wait a minute, should I make some adjustments here? So think instead about taking that binder, take the most, two or three most salient pages out of the middle, rip them out, sit down with people that are actually going to buy your product, make sure that those are right, stand them on your feet, and on its feet as a proof of concept, or in Agile speak, they call MVP, the minimum viable product, and then iterate from there. And that was something that was really helpful to us here. So on the right side here, it shows you what a typical Agile cycle would be like. And this is actually could be a cycle for any project, except that instead of doing this once over the course of 18 months or two years, which some public sector IT procurement processes look like, and then they come back with their $60 million product that doesn't work, do this over two years, and then do it again, and then do it again, and then do it again. Of course, Fundamental to any of this is to make sure that you 
build for number three is that having a good team, a solid team. Um, uh, there we go, build on the right team. You wanna make sure that you gather change agents, of course, that's critical to any process, especially if you're endeavoring to do something differently. Um, fostering a collaborative culture, secure air cover. I'll give an example that's kind of related to what we talked about a second ago with regard to Agile. So imagine going to the controller's office who's used to, okay, you're sending out your request for proposal, whatever, how much is it, okay, right, and your specs are, and you say, well, we don't, we don't totally know our specs yet, and we, we don't totally know what the total project cost is gonna be. We're gonna kinda just gonna do it every two couple, every couple weeks, we'll let you know how much we spend. That's an interesting conversation to have. But what our CFO and our department says, which is really great, Benjamin McCloskey makes the case yeah, but you know what? Every two weeks, you're getting something. You're getting delivered something. And at any point, if you don't like what you're got, not getting, you shut you get what you're getting. You shut it off. Um, consult best practices. We talked about the benefit that we received from our working with Google, and I can't can't underscore that. The idea: of, if there's something you want to do, look around and see what's been done. Of course. And then finally, building the finding the right partners. We've been very fortunate in our work with Exigy to find someone who cares about the problem. Um, it makes a big difference to have somebody, particularly in an agile process, that's thinking with the same mindset about how to solve this problem, because none of us know at the outside, uh, excuse me, the outside, what it's gonna look like. Um, before then, though, is the idea of building modularly. We talked about that, and I mentioned that the procurement process has to change. Maintaining open communication. So I guess what I wanna say about that is that Rather than, well, let's have a kickoff meeting, and again, we'll see you in 18 months, and we'll see how it turns out. It's, we have meetings, we're probably in six or seven meetings a week together, in one fashion or another, whether it's the design, or engineering, or project management, or one piece or another. It's a constant partnership, communication partnership, uh, working on the problem. I actually just wanted to add on the procurement side, um, how important this is to be able to set up procurement so that you can work in an agile format. Um, you know, typically a lot of public sector agencies will work by sending out a large spec sheet uh, to the vendor and saying, hey, come back in a year, show us a product, cool. Um, and at that time, user needs have changed, business rules have changed, and the product doesn't meet the need anymore, right? Um, so if you're able to set up the procurement process, like Barry and Benjamin and others were at MoCD, in a way that saying, hey, here's some of what we want to build because we've talked to users and done some discovery work um, but we really want you to continue testing release something test some more and continue to build it out that really helps um, Barry's team was able to release this product in 90 days so three months from us writing the first line of code we released something and all it really was was a site that had one type of rental listings listed. Um, so nothing more, no online application, no translation in other languages, no accounts. Um, we just released that and we started to see how people interacted with the site and then started to layer on features. And we were able to really course correct because of that. Um, and then MoCD in that scenario is able to fully utilize XG skills in design and engineering and product as opposed to kind of dictating, here's what we've already decided, can you just go build it? Um, you're not really getting the bang for your buck from the pu public sector side to do that. Um. So in summary, ask the user. Um, can't emphasize that enough. Start small, test and iterate, build the right team, and find the right partners. So let's check in again with the diagram that Roshan introduced to us and see where we are. So we talked about introducing products between agencies like MoCD and our constituents, the public, um, to improve service delivery primarily. But what we found though, in this process of sitting with people and listening to their needs, and not just applicants, but all our partners, is that we were building a feedback loop. We were building new communication with this constituency that helps us do our job better overall. And even outside of the context of the product itself, yeah, and I, I think to dig a little bit deeper into that, this feedback loop story is really around data. Um, and so the data that we've seen has started to help us improve services, but it's also starting to help improve policy. And by policy, I mean policy at a variety of levels. So I'm going to give a couple of stories around how Dahlia has started to do this. Um, 
So one story is at the program effectiveness level. So like Barry mentioned, um, uh, the San city of San Francisco runs their housing on a lottery system. So the leasing agent will run a lottery and then use that ranked um, uh, lottery numbers to lease up the building. Um, so in that lottery process, um, we have something called preferences. So it's basically certain citizens who get preferential treatment in the lottery because they might have been evicted um, from a certain neighborhood at a certain time, or they currently live in the same neighborhood as the listing, and we want to keep them in that neighborhood and retain them. So there's different preferences uh, for people in the housing lottery process. Um, one thing we were seeing is that people were really not taking advantage of these preferences that actually gave them a huge leg up um, in the lottery. And one preference they were not taking advantage of is called the neighborhood resident housing preference. Uh, so this is the preference where if you live in the same neighborhood as the listing, uh, we'll give you preferential treatment to be able to uh, retain you in that neighborhood. Um, and only about 40% of folks were actually claiming this preference. So um, what we did was we really just simply redesigned this page. Um, we added a banner at the top and said, hey, you we explained it to them because nobody understands what neighborhood resident housing preference means. Um, and we, we actually changed some of the content. We worked with Barry's office to say, hey, can we just call it live in the neighborhood preference? Like, is that okay? And they're like, yeah, that's okay. As long as somewhere else on the page, we put neighborhood resident housing preference because we have to have that on the page. So working kind of within the business rules of the organization to make things more user friendly. And we saw the uptake of, uh, or the claim rate of this preference jump to about 88%. So more than double the claim rate. Really simple design and code changes. Um, so you're able to see if people are claiming services that they are eligible for, and if they're not, how can you drive them to those services and programs um, and, and uh, encourage them to claim it and describe it to them in a more human way. Um, so another example is a little bit above the programmatic level, kind of going to the organizational level. Um, so Barry's colleagues at the Mayor's Office of Housing are currently, as we speak, um, rewriting the housing policy manual that the Mayor's Office of Housing uses. So it's a lot of business processes around how buildings are listed, um, what the building needs to do to report to the Mayor's Office of Housing, kind of all the business rules around managing the housing process. Um, and a lot of conversations in that rewrite came from the product. So one really small example of this is that um, on a listing, the minimum income you need to get into that listing is generally a multiplier of rent. So if rent is 500 bucks a month, then the minimum income requirement might be two times that, or three times that, or 3.2 times that. Um, the problem was that each building was using a different multiplier. So when our engineers asked, okay, cool, we want to build a site, what's the multiplier rule, like what multiplier do buildings usually use? We were like, uh, we actually don't know. Um, and every building is doing their own thing. Um, so the mayor's office of housing is taking the opportunity to streamline rules like that um, and really create a more equitable process between buildings and a consistency that didn't exist before. Um, this is happening at a lot of different business process levels. So that's business processes. Um, the third and kind of final layer is starting to get to this legislative level. Um, so we are starting to see a lot of data come through Dahlia, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, the Mayor's Office of Housing can now understand where should we invest in housing? Um, what should we build? Is Are two bedrooms meeting the need of the population more than three bedrooms and studios? Do people like to live in certain neighborhoods? Why is that? Is it close to transit? Are there jobs there? Um, they can start to analyze um, what's coming through the site to better understand where they should invest their time and money and their programs. Um, and a little bit more just about kind of the demographics we're seeing in Dahlia. Um, a lot of folks are applying not surprisingly, from a lot of major barrier cities to live in San Francisco. Um, we're seeing over 89 languages represented um, on the site, um, a really wide age range, so 25 to 65. Um, we have a lot of senior buildings on the site, so we see seniors apply. Um, and about 58% uh, of users right now are accessing the site on mobile. Um, it's really common for folks to access it on mobile, as mm -hmm. mobile is generally a primary access point for internet for a lot of users. Um, a lot of people uh, access the site through their housing counselor or at a public computer also, or, or at their local nonprofit. 
Um, so we're, we're trying to understand like who is seeing the site, where are they coming from, um, what's really the need in San Francisco. And the reason we can start to analyze this at a little bit more of a population level is because we really are getting a lot of data coming through. Um, so at this point, we're about at 1.4 uh, million um, site visits. Um, and we can start to see the trend over years. So what was happening in 2015, 2016? Um, how do we see, as there are more listings coming online, different things that people gravitate towards? Um, and there's really this volume of data coming at Mayor's Office of Housing in a way that wasn't before. Um, and Barry's gonna talk a little bit about what the Mayor's Office of Housing team is saying about this data. Yeah, um, sometimes when we talk about this, I, I like to say, and you thought we were talking about a service delivery product. We, we thought we were too. And all of a sudden, we have what one of my colleagues refers to as this data exhaust. There's so much stuff that we get from Google Analytics, and we use another service called Heap Analytics. It's just like, wait a minute. And one of the things, I talked earlier about one of government's roles is to have an eye on equity. And so as Maria Benjamin, the director of our housing placement programs says, we finally have real data to help us identify and remove barriers to housing placement for specific segments of our population. So let's look at our housing funnel, if you will, for a second. So up at the top level, we have now almost 1.5 million site visits. And let's say that we can say, oh, it's interesting. Uh, of those 1.5 million site visits, 8% are X demographic. Okay. And then we have 80,000 plus applications. Well, wait a minute, only 6% of the applications are that demographic. And this is interesting, in the almost 2,500 units that we've placed to date through Dahlia, it drops to 5%. What's going on? What's the problem? Is there an issue in the app that's dissuasive to people creating an application? Is there something in our process? And that's something that obviously is of great concern to us and this gives us an opportunity to really look at what's happening with that even beyond that though we Roshan made reference to this um, in a steering committee meeting about a year and a half ago Kate Hartley who's our executive director said simply and eloquently and succinctly this will change what we build dramatic pause there because the way it used to be, think about that, is that, okay, we have some money to build some housing and there's a lot and it's not quite like this, but there's a little bit of, well, what do you guys think? Uh, 10 studios and one bed, 10 one bedrooms? Because that's what we did last time. It, there was no source of data to understand what would, we should we actually be building. Now we can say, wait, stop, stop. If you're gonna build a 50 unit building in the mission in that area, People of this household size and that income, that race, ethnicity, with that operating system, with their computer, are looking for that type of unit. Whoa. We, like, we've never had that before. We've been in regional conversations, um, smaller jurisdictions in the Bay Area, where someone from the city council will say, yeah, you know, uh, and maybe it's an affluent city council member. Yeah, I was driving through and I, I saw a Latino family on the street and I thought, you know, we should build some more of those units like that. Like, well, okay, well, that's a little bit ad hoc, a decision like that. So it's really exciting to have this information that will help us answer the question, okay, we know we have a housing crisis. What kind of housing crisis? Who particularly is struggling? And how do we focus the relatively scarce resources that we have on this issue. So again, to go back to our diagram, because we love diagrams. Um, so we've talked about where products are, we've talked about this feedback loop between agencies and the public that the product is starting to create. Um, but what we're really talking about here, when we're talking about changing business rules and policy, is a larger feedback loop between policymakers and the public. Um, and Barry mentioned this uh, earlier, but he leads a steering committee uh, at the city, and they check in on Dahlia really regularly. And Can the steering committee is comprised of um, housing policy advisor for the mayor, mayor's chief yes, of staff, right. a lot of folks that either influence or are involved with policy making in the city. Um, so they're able to start to have these touch points to say, 
okay, what's coming through Dahlia? What are we seeing? The city can even start to say, we have this inclusionary housing policy. How is that working out for people? Are people actually accessing this housing? How is it working? Uh, whose needs is it meeting? Whose needs is it not meeting? Um, so this conversation um, that's being started at the steering committee and other places is really exciting to us because we get to use this really, you know, pretty simple digital product to start these really larger um, policy level conversations at the city and county. Um, and if this kind of feedback loop process looks familiar to you, especially a lot of folks who use Agile and are in the startup community, that's probably because it is. There it is. That's right. That's that diagram we pulled from the earlier slide. The idea of being able to sort of make pivots on the fly in your development. We were talking about that in the context of building a product. Now we're talking about it in the context of establishing policy. Because we have those feedback loops and more frequent interaction between the public and policymakers, we can do a better job of aligning policy uh, to the needs of constituents. Yep. Um. And I, I think we're really particularly excited about this cycle of, of, of feedback loops, and um, Barry's really passionate about this image. It's a great image of City Hall, I think. That's right. So uh, I love this picture because this is, well, this is San Francisco City Hall, for those of you that don't know. So there's this beautiful old, I'll say, legacy government building that now has this fancy digital LED lighting system. Uh, you know. The idea is that we can take the strengths of a legacy system, like we've discussed earlier. Um, again, the service delivery infrastructure, democratic process, eye on equity. We can leverage that with this groundbreaking, agile, data-driven process that allows us to shorten innovation cycles. So again, we can kind of, I, I imagine one corner of this building sort of with cat five cables wrapped up in an old stone column. Like we can, I, I, and we're really excited about the possibilities that that, that methodology offers. Yeah. Um, so we'll be around all week. We're really excited to chat with every one of you. Um, like Barry mentioned, we're actually uh, talking to a lot of other jurisdictions about Dolly itself um, to implement it kind of regionally and think through what a regional solution uh, and a regional kind of database sort of affordable housing looks like, uh, first here in the Bay and then in other um, areas. So please come talk to us about that. Um, Exigy also uh, is running a webinar on June 13th on the procurement and RFP process. So um, this is something Barry mentioned is really critical to be able to find the right partner and really build sound products. Um, so if that's something you're interested in or you have a partner, um, a government partner that might be interested in it, um, you can learn more about that at exigy.com slash webinar. Um, and we're really excited to, to meet more of you this week. Thanks. Thank you guys.